the weekly industry angel podcast hears from business leaders and entrepreneurs who share their stories and that all important light bulb moment this can inspire us all and maybe scratch that itch and kickstart that idea that keeps you awake at night Welcome to episode 18 of The Industry Angel. We've had some fantastic feedback again from across the episodes. Andy Young enjoyed Pete Robinson from episode 17 around kids gaming. I saw a great photo of a before and after of his son Jake reading a book. And then an hour later, with a tablet in his hand and headphones on, following the internet coming back on. A familiar story, Andy. Jared Leake enjoyed Lisa Spencer on Nell. And he might attempt to ask his wife, Sarah, what it's like to meet him. Let me know the answer, please, Jared. Chris Appleton recently found the show and started with episode three. That was Brad Burton. Chris is reading Brad's book and his company are bringing Brad in shortly, he said. I hope you guys enjoy that. So thanks for keeping in touch. Please don't forget to review the show as well. And I need you to tell at least one person a week about Industry Angel. There you go. Today we have coach, author, speaker, and finder of unicorns. Welcome to Industry Angel, Heather Wild. I'm so happy to be here, Ian. Hi, Heather. I had to get the unicorn reference in, but no doubt we'll get onto that later, yeah? Oh, absolutely. So thanks for your time today. I know we've got some time difference because you're over in Las Vegas, Nevada. Yeah, Las Vegas. Uh, the Viva Las Vegas. <laughs> Indeed. And I'd, I'm normally typically British and I ask, so I ask our guests how the weather is, but you know, I know the answer. <laughs> yeah, it is a beautiful, sunny 90 degrees already at 7.30 in the morning. Really? Wow, we've got about 50 Fahrenheit. Uh, you're, you're, you're Fahrenheit, yeah? <laughs> yes, Fahrenheit. So yeah, we're cloudy, overcast and, and 50 Fahrenheit in your money, so not too good. <laughs> so Heather, reading your background, it's like the background of two or three people. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that a lot. <laughs> and I know um, I'm going to get I'm going to do your backstory. All right. Because I don't know how you've squeezed all this. in. <laughs> Normally, I ask our guests to, to give us their little bit of a, a bio, but I'm going to do this for you. OK, is that all right? That's perfectly fine. Right. Let me know if I'm missing anything out. So you've studied aerospace engineering. You've studied mathematics. You've even done medieval British literature out of our Cambridge University. You've programmed microcontrollers for the Navy, worked on NASA projects, you've been a flight attendant, designed and managed online games for major licenses, run HR departments for small business and 5,000 plus employees, designed and uh, managed the support infrastructure at Evernote from its early days through its milestone of 100 million users. You're currently the CTO of Rocketeer, you serve on the IT Sector Council of Nevada, you volunteer your time with girls in tech, and so on and so on and so on. Is that right? <laughs> that is right, yes. <laughs> so where, where are we going to start with all this? Oh, well, um, <laughs> I, uh, I think that what we can start with is uh, that where a Rocketeer, where I work right now, um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I have the immense privilege of working with companies around the world, um, both large and small. And um, it, it's actually a dual role um, where I am the unicorn whisperer um, and I get to uh, be a, a coach, an advisor to these companies um, where I, I can help them on their path uh, to grow um, with all of the experience that I've gotten along the way. So it's really, really an amazing thing. So do you do that face to face, Heather? You know, you're talking about doing international work there. Are you, are you hopping on and off planes or are you doing a lot of calls like this? Or? Um, it, well, it's a combination of both. So, um, I mean, I, I am on the road about six months a year. Um, and uh, But I do a lot of uh, Skype uh, and Google Hangout and WhatsApp and, and everything. I, I try to meet my, uh, my people where they are. Um, but it's, it is, I, I have very, very long days. <laughs> <laughs> right. So in terms of uh, Rocketeer, you know, what, what are those people that you help? You know, you mentioned a few there, but, you know, what do they actually do? What, what industries are they and what they're looking for from you guys? Um, well, they're actually in all industries, which I mean, and that's really cool because, uh, I mean, I, as you mentioned, I've been in a lot of different industries. I've been in healthcare. I've been in hospitality. I've been in gaming uh, and high tech and government and <laughs> and um, and it, so, 
uh, people come to me for, uh, for all of those things. Um, and it's, it's and not just me, but all of the people in Rocketeer. We have finance. We have uh, it's it's really really cool because what what's interesting is that no matter what industry you're in, it all comes down to humans. Like there are people in every single company, in every single business, just everywhere, and they all they all need help in some way. <laughs> You know, you do a similar thing to me in terms of coaching, but you've got the best job in the world. You you go into an organization, you see what they're all about, you help them, you watch them grow, you may walk away, but it's so rewarding. It is it is this fantastic meeting with, with sort of, you know, entrepreneurial spirits, I imagine. Yes, yeah. And what, one thing I noticed uh, early on when I started to do this, uh, actually, it was back when I was with Evernote still, um, was that no matter where you are in the world, people ha encounter the same issues. And it doesn't matter what industry you're in. Say like you're in Pakistan and you're a first time business owner and you're uh, deciding that you, you want to open like a, a hat shop or something. And like you may be the first person in your town that's ever done this. But like, who do you turn to to ask? Who do you turn to to ask for help? Um, well, maybe there's somebody in, in uh, like Cleveland, Ohio, that has been through exactly the same thing that you have. But how would you ever meet that person? <laughs> so um, thank you, internet, for being able to connect people, you know? Uh, so like, I, I love this kind of world now that, that we actually can reach out and, and do that. So it's, it's a different world and, and uh, and I get to to facilitate these kind of conversations for people. You know what's funny though? You you meet these kind of people, and I think you alluded to it there. They say that they're very unique. No one does it like us, and no one will have these problems. But you, you sit there and you think you're not. Everyone's got this similar sort of issues in terms of process. I meet a lot of manufacturers. They're essentially taking some material and adding a bit of value to it, and then you know creating a product. It's as simple as that kind of thing. But there's little processes and nuances along the way. But they always panic and think that, you know, oh, we're so different and they're not. Right. <laughs> well, well, I mean, they are and they aren't. So, like, <laughs> I mean, there's processes that are the same and that they can apply. Um, but there's always, I like to say, I mean, one of the things that I teach is that everyone is an expert in something. Everyone has something special that no one else has. And because they have their perspective on, on things because of whether socioeconomic, the way they sure. were raised, the, like, and that'll be the thing that makes them different, like the Pakistan person versus the Cleveland, Ohio person. But they can apply the learnings uh, and, and become like really like sister companies to each other and, and help each other grow together. Um, and that's, what's really cool. Um, so, so yeah, I mean like they may, yes, the same thing has been done before. I mean like Shakespeare's plays, how many times have they been rewritten into movies and I mean, and even he wasn't the first person to come up with those plots. They were being done by Aristophanes and, <laughs> <laughs> and even before that, but, uh, there, there are no new ideas, but there are but the human is what makes them different. Love that. Yeah, you're right. So everybody has a different my a different background and whatever that background and history and experiences you've come up with, you're the expert in you're the expert of you, yeah? Exactly. Absolutely. I call that the unicorn idea. Ah, uh, so here we go. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, that, there's a nice lead in. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm trying to redefine the word unicorn because it's become, <laughs> no, I mean, it really, it has become this stigma where you have to raise a billion dollars or else you're not successful. Yeah. And that's yeah, yeah. terrible. <laughs> sure. Because you, you, it, it, it's unrealistic um, because hitting that billion dollar valuation uh, re I mean, and I know because I was in Evernote for six years, it requires you to give up your identity. It requires you to give up everything about yourself uh, in order to, to hit that and maintain it. Whereas you, like having that idea, it, if you keep your identity and build a 
company around that passion, that fire, that drive, then you can change the world. So Heather, you, you, once you get to the really large companies, do you lose that identity, that background, that passion? or? Uh, it's very hard to keep it. Okay. I mean, you have to work at it every day. And, and if you have a very strong, like if, if you work at it very, very hard, then you can keep it. And, and a lot of the companies uh, that are successful um, for a very long time can, can do it. I mean, for example, Apple, um, they, they've been going for 40 years now and they, they definitely have a very strong identity and drive. And if you go into the Apple headquarters, if you go into an Apple store, you can feel that, like you, you understand that vision, that drive, like every person in that company, uh, is a part of it. And some people say it's cultish, but that's exactly what it needs to do. Every person in the company needs to live and breathe what that power is. Um, but when you, when you lose that, even for a second, it falters. And they actually had many years there where they did. So do you think, you know, from an entrepreneurial point of view, do you, do you think companies can start out with not the best product or service, but with a culture? And a, and, a, and a dream and a, and a perseverance to make it work? Uh, if you think you don't have a culture uh, right from the start, then you, I mean, you, you already have a culture from day one. Like it, people that say we'll get to it later, they're kidding themselves. So, sure. so yeah, I mean, it always starts with the dream. It always does. But what if that dream is similar to somebody else's, but the entrepreneur or the founders behind it have, have a, a bigger identity, a bigger passion for, for culture and identity. Do you know, do you know what I'm uh, saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, so somebody like Tony Shea, who I've worked with quite closely out here uh, in Las Vegas, uh, who's the CEO of Zappos, who wrote Delivering Happiness, which, is, uh, which a lot of entrepreneurs use as, as their Bible for culture. Um, he is like culture first before product. Um, yeah. and that's very important. Um, because I mean, it's, it's, if, if you have a great culture, um, then the, the products will, uh, they'll, they'll shine through. Like for example, in Google, like you, you know, instinctively what to do with Google because they, they, their passion shows through in, all of their products. Um, so, I mean, any product they have, it's, it's just, it, it, the vision comes through. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, when you have somebody that is, like, when you have a leader that is visionary, then it, it's, it's kind of get on board or, or leave, you know? Um, but if you don't have a great, idea then it there's no there's nothing to follow sure no that's that's a really good point so do you see there's a lot of startups i mean obviously you're over there uh in, in vegas do you see there's a lot of startups over there's the tech scene really big you know is it is it the, the 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 trendy thing to do to start a company or to go work for somebody else what's the you know what are the young school leavers want to do <laughs> um so I mean, I'm very, I mean, it, it, it's a 45 minute flight to, to Silicon Valley here. Uh, so I'm back and forth a lot. Uh, and I'm also, I, I, I go to New York a lot and I'm, I mean, I'm every major hub here in, in the States I'm, I'm in quite often. And, and basically the s students are starting out even as early as high school here, which is, I mean, I mean, at 15, 16 years old, uh, they're, they're starting their own companies to try them out because it's so easy to do that now. Um, and by the time they're out of college, uh, out of university, they, they may be on their third or fourth company, uh, which is something that wasn't even possible when I was going through school. Uh, it's everyone, I mean, there are, there's something different that's happening now. Like there's a lot of one person companies, 
and that's something that I've never seen before. I mean, more people are, are starting out on their own uh, because they, they can be f- the front end and back end coder. And I'm seeing a lot of people going for investment uh, where they're the solopreneur. So that's the new trend. They're like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's why I asked because I, I, you know, I was down in London a couple weeks ago and I was sat on the tube and there was two two really young guys in front of me and I was I was earwigging, which means listening in. <laughs> so I was listening in and I could hear these two guys talking about who was going to be the next CTO for them. And they were saying, you know, one might, go in a year or two time and then what we're going to do with these shares and the other one will be, will be here to stay and heal. And I just thought, wow, it's it's amazing to see these two young guys talking this way. It, it's totally changed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, I mean, right now or just recently, I mean, even with all of the stuff that I'm doing, um, I, I was just asked to become an interim CTO uh, at, from an advisor role that I was already holding um, because it's so hard to find CTOs. And one of the things that I can do is help people find CTOs. So um, they were just like, we just need you for a little bit more time than you're already doing as an advisor. So can you step in to help us find a CTO? Because it's really hard. (laughs) Sure, yeah. (laughs) So I was like, all right, let me calculate out my time. (laughs) And then then five years later, you're still there. (laughs) Well, no, no, no. That's what happens when you view it. Well, no, I really, I don't have the time to do it. I'm doing so much stuff, but but this I can actually do. And and there's, but there's so much talent out there. And a lot of these people uh, that have the talent to do it, they're just, they're being everything for their whole company. And once they get their MVP done, once they get that all coded, then they're getting funding and they're hiring a full team where before you needed at least three people to be able to get to the point where you could get funding to hire the full team. So that's what's different now. It's a great point. We've also got things like, you know, Dragon's Day and a shark tank in your, in your country where, you know, it, this is now the what people asp- aspirations now to be an entrepreneur to start companies and the, the lifeblood of the economy really these small medium enterprises you know and you often hear about the the bigger guys you know the uh, the large corporations but it's the smaller guys that I love to see and love to see what they're doing because it's so innovative. Oh yeah, and and uh, I mean I've uh, uh... I've had a lot of experience with some products that have ended up on, on Shark Tank over here. And uh, one thing that's, that's gotten interesting over the years is, what, whereas before you could get on with, with an early on idea stage kind of company, now you have to show major traction before they even get you in. So that's really interesting because it's getting more and more competitive. Like you have, yeah. you have to have not just the idea patented, but you have to show like years of growth and, and uh, lots of revenue. And that makes me very excited because more companies are understanding, oh, we actually have to be successful now. We can't just be in the seed, like the early seed stage. So uh, it's, it's becoming um, a really entrepreneurial society now. So, you know, you touched upon um, your interim CTO position there, and I know you're really keen on mentorship, yeah? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So is, is that something that you're doing with, with this company in question? Are you sort of mentoring them along the way and then kind of putting a CTO in place and then and then leaving them and going off into the sunset? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm on their board of advisors. So, yeah. um, so once I get, I mean, so yes, I'm, I'm mentoring them along the way. Um, like I help them come up like on their advisory board, I help them come up with like an algorithm for, uh, their, uh, f- for their back end, and then once once I get their CTO in place, then I will go back to the advisory board position. <laughs> so I mean, sure. it's things that. So I mean, this is something like I mean, I choose carefully the com- because of my time, because of so many, like my regular day jobs and things. Like I I choose carefully the companies that I'll be on a board for, but that's that's also normal for uh, uh, people like me with all of the the stuff that I do, but I, I am a mentor for, um, like I do a lot of mentorship roles for like through girls in tech, through the nonprofits that I'm part of through my, uh, uh, sector council work and and things like that. You know, we're talking about trends, uh, mentorship for me, that seems to really, really taken off. I mean, in my early career, I think in the nineties, I had my first mentor, 
but it came around by default. I remember we had these annual appraisals and uh, the, he the head of the department did, did mine. And he asked me what I wanted to do. And I, and I said I wanted his job. And I was just young and just blurted out. And luckily he laughed. And uh, he said, well, okay, I'll get you there. And, and he mentored me and nobody else had a mentor. And that was kind of the first. So I've always really had a mentor from being a young guy. But now you see mentorship, pretty much everyone's looking for one. So a question to you is how, how do you find a mentor, Heather? Well, uh, there's a, <laughs> I, I actually get asked this quite a lot. Um, I, I think there's different levels of mentors. Um, f first of all, there's, there's passive mentors where you find, um, you find a lot of, of mentors that like you just, uh, you find like you may read a book like by Guy Kawasaki and think, Oh my gosh, that person's amazing. And then you read everything by Guy Kawasaki and then he's a mentor for you because, uh, you really like his style. So that would be a passive mentor. An active mentor would be somebody like you did. You ask your boss and you say, Hey, I really want to be you someday. And they're like, okay, well I'll get you there. Um, and somebody like that, you, you have to be very careful not to overburden them because then they can be fatigued because what are they getting out of it? You know, I mean, well, yes, what, what I get out of it is I absolutely love to see people grow. Um, and then we can grow together, you know, because I've had, uh, one of my mentors, uh, like he's been my mentor for 20 years now, over 20 years. And, um, as he's grown in his career, I've grown in my career and he just keeps growing and I just keep growing and it's just sure. amazing. Um, and I'm never going to catch up to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, well that, that's a really good thing. You see, so what's he getting out of that, Heather? Uh, he absolutely adores seeing what, like how, how I've grown in different ways. Uh, mm. And I'm so proud to see where he grows. And it's like he, he'll bring me into his life in different ways. And it's just, it's so, I mean, every like year or two, we'll check in with each other and see where we've gotten. And, and it's, it's not like every week we're, we're calling each other, but we're, we're there in each other's lives and that's cool. Um, we, but I would, I 100% would not be where I am today without the mentorship and guidance that he gave me. I mean, I love call to actions on this show, Heather, and I, and I think that is one there. If someone doesn't have a, a mentor, you know, get out there and, and try and find one. So how do you approach a mentor? You think, right, okay, I, I like this lady, I like this guy, he's, you know, what do you do? You go up to them and you say, I think you're amazing. I love this about you. Can you tell me how, uh, can you tell me about yourself? Like, how did you get to the, where you are? You don't say, I mean, you can say like, will you mentor me? But I mean, the way I always have the conversation is be like, tell me about yourself. Tell me about your life. Have you been there? Like, uh, as a coach, like my, my favorite thing to say to people is give me the greatest hits album of your life. <laughs> right. Okay. So like when people, <laughs> what, like, because I love music. So when I, when people start thinking about like the songs that define their lives, then it opens up a whole new conversation that, and like we become fast friends, you know? So if you can think of something like that, uh, somebody else says, tell me everything you've done in your life since you were six. Um, and that just starts like other people laughing and then they start thinking like, wow, like what, what's important that I can tell this person that I've done since I was six years old, wow. Um, and the reason that you do that is because it's, it's a different kind of question and it shows that you want to know how this person got to where they were. Um, it's not you asking them like pointed questions. It's them telling you what they consider important. And, and then you just listen because listening is, is the most important part of mentorship. So would you suggest maybe getting a mentor for a, a number of areas? So say somebody wanted to brush up skills on culture. We spoke about culture today. And then somebody wanted to have a bit more on entrepreneurial finances, projections, forecasting. Would you have different people for different disciplines? Uh, absolutely. I have so many different mentors in so many different areas because you can only learn from someone like on a mentorship capacity, the, uh, the experiences that they've had 
Um, and that's another reason why I am a coach, like, because a coach pulls out things within you. Uh, whereas a mentor, like if somebody's asking me questions, I can only tell them what I've done. So like as a mentor coach, it's a two way conversation. So you're asking the questions over the mentor and as a coach, you're asking them questions. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so I just try to work that one up. Yeah. My head. <laughs> yeah. So, so like, I, like they can ask me a question and then I can be like, so what does that bring up in you? Yeah. 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 I guess there's a bit of crossover there as well, or, you know, as a coach, you are sort of mentoring as well. And yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Excellent. Wow. So I'm going to pick your brains on Evernote. I want to know how that went. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, that, that's a, that's a broad question. Um, so, <laughs> I know, I know you, cause I, I don't want to give you any lead ins. I just want you to tell yeah. me. What you... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that, that's exactly what a coach would do. It's like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> what came up for you when I mentioned the word Evernote? Um, so, so the, actually what, what came up was, um, when, when Evernote was starting out, uh, there were only a, f a handful of us and, um, we had no idea if it was going to work. Um, we, because, well, I mean, there, it actually started with an idea. It started with Phil Libin, uh, really wanting to, who was the CEO, uh, who's now chairman of the board. Um, he, he really, really wanted to, uh, have a place where he could have stored his n notes from and doodles and drawings from when he was 12 years old and be able to have pulled them up. And he was really disappointed that he didn't have that. Um, because he actually, like me, is really afraid that when he's older, his memory is going to fade. So uh, one day, like we were out having dinner. Um, it was like this really long, many course sushi dinner. And out of a long ramble, he said, I just want something where I could remember everything. And when he said that, like, I got chills and I looked up at him. And that was when I decided that I was going to go work for Evernote. Like, I was going to go work for him again after I just left him, for, after working for him for five years. And I'm like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, that's the whole, I mean, that, that's what, like, having both a visionary leader and a good product it means like if you have if you have the the vision if you have the person the right person to lead you and the right product then then like you can design everything around it and then so that led to like six years of of making sure that everything we did had something to do around that core idea of what it what if when you're 70 or 80 or 90, you could still have those memories from when you were 12, from when you were three, th those first crayon drawings, you know, that, that was the core purpose. And we never lost sight of that. So, so there was this one particular uh, thing, uh, this one particular support case that I worked on. Um, I mean, because I, I didn't have to do much support. I was like the head of of this like global department, but like the really tricky things would get to me and then I would have to like mobilize sure. everyone. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and it was this, this poor person, uh, and it just sticks in my memory. Um, they had, they had, uh, recorded the, they'd used Evernote to record their baby's first heartbeat. And uh, unfortunately, because of a glitch in the software, uh, when they uploaded it, it got lost. And like our, it went through like multiple support agents. Like, I mean, in, in like an hour, like people were like, oh no, sure. no, 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 no. Um, and it got to me and I was like, no, we did not lose this person's like first recording. I mean, cause it wasn't obviously the baby's first heartbeat, but it was the first time they heard it. Yeah. And and I was like, no, we did not lose this person's memory of this because this was this is the purpose of Evernote. So, uh, so then I spent three weeks reconstructing that file so wow. so that they had it. And oh, I'm tearing up thinking about this. And then sure. <laughs> Well, I can imagine everybody drafted the skills in because it is such an emotive subject and everyone can feel it. And yeah. And then when, 
when we were able to get that file back and send it back to that person, there were cheers. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I remember calling that person on the phone. Like I got his phone number and I called it back. Yeah. I yeah. paid it back to him over the phone and he was like, oh my gosh, this, like, I am not only a customer for life, but I'm talking yeah. to everyone about sure. how beautiful this is. But yeah. like, I mean, yeah, like I actually had to like reconstruct the file <laughs> like by, by like X programming it, but, but it was like, but we, we had, but. Did you work the costs out on this and how much that cost well, you? <laughs> like, it doesn't matter. It, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <for sure. laughs> like this, this was like, we're, we are not losing people's memories because like, again, like the whole purpose is when that guy's 90 and he's trying to remember the first heartbeat that's that's the point that's why we do this and if you can keep that in your heart in your mind in every person's like in every bit of everyone's com- like in that company then you've won and so i know that even though i've been out of that company for 2 years i know that my training that I wrote for all the people on that, like the support people worldwide is still there. And that I am like, I have absolute faith that like, if something like that comes in, that they will still do that regardless of the cost. And that is the important part of these companies. You're looking back over this quick discussion there last half hour, you mentioned sort of greatest hits of your life and that kind of thing. I asked you Evernote there on that super broad question, and you've come back with two things to me there. You've come back with that core discussion in the sushi restaurant that mm-hmm. sticks in your mind, and then the heartbeat story. You know, you were there for six years. You must have had all sort, you know, loads of different experiences. But isn't it amazing that those are the greatest hits yep. of your life when you think of Evernote? Mm-hmm. Love them stories. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the time here. We've, we've done it. I always do this, you know. This is a, such a selfish uh, podcast for me because I just sit and chat to people like you, and I thoroughly enjoy myself. And we've got through 35 minutes already. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm going to try and wrap it up. But before we do, can you? Is there any books you could recommend our listeners? Because I know they're really popular. Um, it's a really popular question with our listeners. They love to hear. So, do you have anything that you recommend? Well, you know what's funny. I actually. Uh tell people that I don't generally read business books. And the Mm -hmm. thing that I recommend that everybody should read is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Go get in. (laughs) Fantastic. Uh, And the reason for that is because if you don't have a little fun and if you don't spend the time to just relax, then uh, you're you're going to overwork. And so everyone everyone should be able to... uh, to just uh, remember not to panic. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I won't tell anybody what the answer at the universe is either. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> There's a four in it, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much, Heather. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself, and we'll, we'll have to do this again. Absolutely. Okay, thanks, Heather. You too. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Heather there. I had a few topics I want to discuss with Heather, but once again, I've just rambled and chatted and thoroughly enjoyed myself so I apologize for that I need to do this over a few hours in a bar and then we'll edit the best bits in eh? I didn't even get to crack my joke about um, a unicorn's dad being called popcorn (laughs) sorry sorry I know terrible and Heather told me afterwards that she hadn't told that heartbeat story before and uh, so I thank her for being so open and you know you can hear how much that meant to Heather and to Evernote And I I think mentorship and coaching comes from being able to tell such stories and metaphors. And I, I hope these episodes help you on your journey as well. So until next time, I'm Ian Farah. This is the Industry Angel, and thanks for listening.